Oh yeah! What's happening out there, y'all? What's going on in the podcast stratosphere? What the hell y'all up to? Got a great drummer and a super cool guy in Carter McLean, who can be seen with the simultaneous bass guitar playing juggernaut that is Charlie Hunter, and he also plays in The Lion King on Broadway, so he's mixing it up. Uh, but we were able to meet on a nice day in Manhattan and had some drinks amidst the chaos that is uh, 9th Ave and 40 whatever street it was, just off Times Square essentially. No shortage of people on their phones, tripping over curbs and about to get run over by taxis and bumping into each other and just not paying attention in general. It can be pretty ridiculous. But all things considered, I think it turned out pretty damn good. In any case, we get into navigating the nightmare that is Times Square, uh, getting Lyme disease, which is crazy, the very niche world of playing drums for Broadway shows, the freaky genius of Charlie Hunter and the fly by the seat of your pants nature of performing with him live. Crazy New Orleans stories and great New Orleans drummers. Some of Carter's custom kits and soon to be released signature kit. And uh, finding an identity on your instrument and becoming comfortable with super slow tempos. Plus a little on social media and uh, a whole lot more. Shout out to my sponsor, New Orleans Record Press. If you're going to run physical copies of your project, you might as well run vinyl. And no better place to start than NewOrleansRecordPress.com, where you can build out all the options and get real-time quotes with both competitive rates and quicker turnaround time than the competitors, at least for now. So go on over to that website and tell them Crash Bang Boom sent you. And now, without further ado, here we go. Carter McLean, Crash Bang Boom. Sounds go mad with joy. Yep. All right, Carter McLean, what's happening, dude? Hey, hey. How you doing, man? I am very well. I'm sitting out here, and where are we? We're on... Uh, 45th and 9th? Yeah. It's a very, very New York vibe we got going here, uh, complete with the skin parade is starting. It's one of the things that I truly love about New York once any semblance of like semi-warm weather happens, which today is kind of the first day of spring, I guess yeah. you could say. But uh, yeah, it's, it's great to see all the... The flesh come out and, and uh, all the beautiful people uh, parading themselves. It's been a long wait for spring, I'll tell you that. It I was, really has. I was starting to lose my mind for a while, so yeah. just to be able to sit outside in between shows is, I don't know, that's valuable to me. I hear Even you. Even though it's absolutely bonkers where we're sitting, nobody can see this, but there's um, like every kind of person you could think of. There's 10,000 cars, everybody's power walking. Yeah. It's, it's crazy, man. I worked in Times Square. We can get into you doing the Lion King and your locale as well but i think i did Times square for probably about two and a half years or so and i i began to note at that moment that i think my days might be numbered in new york <laughs> it was killing me man try 16 years doing that <laughs> oh shit it's uh that's why i moved out of the city man i was like i need some peace of quiet yeah for like at least part of my life yeah because working in Times square is just a lot it's just super hectic you got to super you know be on your toes and be aware of what's going on and dodge bicycle people everyone's on their fucking phones yeah not paying attention walking into you and then they look at you like it's your fault yep um and then i go home and i live in connecticut like an hour away and yeah it's like you know deer and fox and don't get lyme disease man watch out for the i've lyme already disease. had limes <laughs> come on i swear to god quick really funny story holy shit not funny but <laughs> i live like 40 minutes from lyme connecticut where it was discovered whoa and i got lyme's disease when i was on tour in norway in the arctic circle you got it there? In Norway. No joke. Are you serious? Yeah, the doctor, they had this like 24-hour uh, test that was like very accurate. And they're like, you got it within the last 48 hours. And what I was were your like, symptoms? I, I don't get headaches. And I got on the flight. We were literally in, in Buda, which is like the Arctic Circle in Norway. It's Whoa. way north. Flying home. And all of a sudden, I feel like somebody's stabbing me in the back of my skull with a steak knife. <laughs> Oh, shit. Like literally every 30 seconds. And I was like, okay, something's wrong. And wow. as soon as I was the longest flight I've ever been on because I couldn't count to 30 without having a stabbing pain. Whoa. So it was super intense. I just tried to like zone out for the flight. Did you have a gig that you were going to? I was to? coming home. <sighs> Dude, Thank imagine God. if you had a gig. Well, this is where the story gets funny. Oh, shit. So I, I, was, I had less than a week off. Go to my doctor. He's like, you have Lyme's disease. Here's some meds. The meds totally helped. Headache went away. And then uh, I had to go to Canada to do another bunch of shows for like five days. 
So I was like, I'll be fine. Get on the airplane. Apparently, which I didn't know, side effect of Lyme's disease is Bell's palsy, where your face freezes up. Whoa! So <laughs> I got off the flight. We were playing this huge outdoor festival. It was like Rush, Kiss, and we were opening for Tedeschi Trucks Band, which is great. Wow. I, mean, I know a bunch of those guys in that band, and they're amazing. So I was stoked to just see them. So I'm sound checking, and I take a sip out of a Poland Spring water bottle, and it starts dribbling out of my mouth, out of the side of my yeah. mouth. And I looked at the bottle, like, what's up, what's up with this bottle? It the was bottle was fine. Facial paralysis. It's my face started to go into paralysis at sound check oh, in fuck. front of like 20,000 people. Jesus, dude. So basically, I, I, I'm like, the guy's like, kick drum, please. I'm like, boom, boom. As I'm Googling side effects <laughs> of Lyme's disease, and it's like Bell's palsy, Bell's. I was like, oh, shit. It was a crazy. I'm not going to keep going on. It was super dark. But like, Holy moly. my face fully froze up. My doctor said it was like an eight and a half out of ten on severity. Whoa! It was really bad. And long story short, my wife saved my ass. She's an acupuncturist and herbalist. She did e stem and like needles on my face three times a day, and I was 100 percent in three weeks. Whoa! Which is pretty intense. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. Don't I don't recommend just, getting Lyme's disease. Yeah. Moral of that story is definitely steer clear of Lyme's Mr. disease. Negroni. Oh, our beers just arrived. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, wow, I was just making a Lyme disease joke. I had no idea that you had actually had it. That's pretty uh, bizarre yeah, it's coincidence. No fun. It's no fun, I will tell you that. Steer clear of that shit, children. Uh, so I guess we can go back a little bit to you playing on The Lion King. You said you've been doing this now for 16 years? Yeah, I was a sub for a long time, like 9, 10 years. And I was in all the time. Like I was doing like three or four shows a week, most weeks. I mean, I was in a lot, which was really cool. And... When the original guy left, basically they were like, look, he's taking a leave of absence. Do you want to cover it for a year? And I was like, I had just bought my house, just gotten married. I was like, hell yeah, man. That's like that Consistent. timing could yeah. not have come at a, a better time. Um, and then the funny thing about actually getting the gig, I, to me, it was a big deal. And for that whole year, people were like congratulating me, man, congrats on the gig. And I was like, no, 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 no it's not my gig. I never let myself think it right. was going to be my gig. Probably wise. Yeah, because if he came back, then it would have been like a right. huge letdown. And so until the day it was up, I was just like, you know, he's going to come back. And no one from the show called me the day of. No no contractors, nobody. And so I called in and just said, hey, should I come to work tonight? Because on my calendar, this is my, I shouldn't be in tonight. Yeah. And they're like, oh, no, man, it's your gig. Congratulations. Oh, shit. I was like, thanks for the heads up, guys. <laughs> and, you know, it was like a big deal for me to get the gig and like, they were just super nonchalant. I didn't sign any paperwork, nothing. It was just like, yeah, it's your gig now. You're in the program. It's all good. That's amazing. Yeah, crazy. Had you had experience playing in in a sort of like theater environment prior to this? No, not not on Broadway. I mean, in college, I did hair because right. I was like one of the few drummers that could like play the stuff. Were you you were reading music? Yeah, but it's like hair was like a rock show. It's so right. simple. Yeah. And then uh, like in high school, I did uh, West Side Story, which is actually even that was hard. Yeah, that, some of that music's tough, um, but Broadway was not anywhere on my radar. Like I wanted to play with Sting, yeah, you know, or Peter Gabriel or Paul Simon or like those, you know, like yeah. people that I love their music. Uh -huh. Broadway for me was like I don't even know what it was. I was like, yeah, they do shows, I guess, like Phantom of the Opera. I don't know. Right. And then you know, it's just funny to fall into that zone, and and being prepared for it. Like I'm not a fantastic reader, but I can read. Yeah. And then to me, that kind of a show, I think the reason I got it is like the feel. Like you have to have a, you have to be very conscious of like what the music calls for, you yeah. know? And that show has a very, luckily I love Peter Gabriel, has a very Peter Gabriel kind of like in your eyes kind of vibe. Right. To it. And so that having that practice a lot, a lot to those kind of records and stuff was like a huge advantage to me, which I didn't know. I just loved those, those tunes. Right. And then when I heard the music, I was like, oh, man, that's basically like that tune in your eyes. Like, I could do that. That's cool. And then it, it worked out, and they liked me, and they kept me, and, and I got the gig. Well, uh, having played so long now at this point, are you still reading music as you're playing it, or are you so acclimated and accustomed to it? You know what's going on. You're, you're, no, I you're... haven't looked at the book in probably 12 years. Wow, that's awesome. I mean, I train guys, new subs once in a while because guys come and go. Yeah. And... Um, it's funny when I'm training them, they're like, in measure 62, and I'm like, well, hold on. And then I look at the music, and it's, like, confusing because I haven't looked at it in 12 years. I'm like, I'm like, is this in the first or second verse? He's like, second verse. I'm like, oh, do this, Phil. 
Right. You know, that's how, you know, it's like if you listen to the same record every day yeah. for 16 years, you just subconsciously know what's going to happen. You know, the best shows that I play are when I'm kind of not totally paying attention uh -huh. because it just happens, yeah. you know, and everything is just smooth at that point. You're not thinking about it. Well, you mentioned uh, living out in Connecticut. Are you originally from the West Coast? No. Well, I was born in San Francisco. Oh, okay. But I only lived there for like a year. So I don't remember that. Oh, really? Oh, so you've yeah. been on the East Coast otherwise. Yeah, my whole life. Oh, okay. Really close to where I live now. Really? Yeah. I mean, I live 20 minutes from where I grew up. Interesting. Um, I love it. It's great. I mean, it's nice to get out of this. Yeah. At night, I get out of the train, and it's, like, quiet. That's you know, amazing. I can see the stars. I don't see any people. It's fantastic. Right. So uh, one other question about doing this Lion King thing. How many uh, members compose, ultimately, the group that plays this music uh there's 20 i want to say there's 24 people in the orchestra wow um that's just musicians then i think everyone in the cast sings right which is i i mean i don't dude i don't even know how many people are on stage a lot <laughs> yeah i mean at least 20 something people uh-huh so at any given point there's like 40 people singing and playing music you know, yeah which is kind of cool well, with your playing, I think you have a really good sense of space, so I would imagine that being an asset, playing with so many moving parts and having so much space already taken up with so many instruments and voices and everything. Totally. So it seems pretty crucial uh, to have that kind of sense that you have, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, just knowing... I mean, that's the thing with that gig. It's so different. Like, the Charlie Hunter gig could not be more opposite than the Lion King gig. Right. It's so improv, so in the moment... You have to kind of just be on your toes musically all the time. Yeah. And really listening. And Lion King is like, play these exact notes every night the same way. Yeah. But you still got to make it feel good like you've never done it. That's the challenge to me is like, you know, play Shadowlands like you've never heard it before. Right. You know, I've played it like 4,000 times at least. <laughs> Jesus. Like, that's like a real number. <laughs> you know? Right. So it's like, all right. Play a song four thousand times, it starts to like play tricks on your mind a little bit. I bet it's you know? like Groundhog's Day. Total, oh, totally, <laughs> man. Don't even get me started on that. <laughs> oh shit. I mean, it's really that's that's something that's difficult. Not everybody's cut out to do something like that either. Yeah, I think it would drive me a little crazy. It's like living on a submarine a little bit. It's like, all right, here we are again, you know. But it's great, man. I mean, I seriously knock on wood that I got that gig. I mean, it's a very, very lucky gig totally. to have in New York. It's like a dream gig. Yeah. You can take off whenever you want. You have a pension. You have health insurance. It's just there. I show up like this. I sit down, put in my ears, and hit the show, and I leave. That's amazing. It's super dope. Wow. Yeah. Well, speaking of, uh, of Charlie Hunter, man, uh, I've been a fan of him uh, for a very long time, living down in New Orleans originally before uh, Katrina, which ultimately landed me in New York. Um, I uh, I would go see Charlie. He would be down there a lot of times during Jazz Fest, like a lot of killer players. Yeah. They just do these kind of these one-off gigs with different players, mix up the players, different venues. And I saw a really killer one uh, where he had Mike Clark on drums, Skerrick was on sax, of course, obviously, Charlie Hunter. For those listening to this, in fact, who are not aware of, of Charlie Hunter, explain what Charlie Hunter does with this bass guitar sort of amalgamation. Well, I've watched him... <laughs> Hours and hours and hours, because we set up kind of facing each other yeah, on I like stage, that. and I play a little bit of guitar and I play a bass a little bit, so like I, I understand those instruments. But watching what he does is like literally a mystery to me. And I've played his instrument. It makes me wonder if he, his brain is split in two He's different. He's smarter areas. than most people. I think he, that That's has a lot. Just to kind of <laughs> the bottom line. I've come to the conclusion. I'm just like, look, dude, you're just smarter than most people, so just enjoy that. <laughs> right. You know, good for you. Right. Um, and he's a badass drummer. Is he really? He's an amazing drummer, actually. Come on. Well, you can't have that feel right. on that instrument and not, and understand not get the drum thing. And he's played with the best drummers on the planet. Right. Um, so, yeah, Charlie's thing, for those that don't know, his name's Charlie Hunter, and he kind of created this instrument where it's four guitar strings and the bottom three strings are bass on the same instrument. So right. he's playing the bass lines, the chords, yeah. and the solos on top of it. Right. So he's kind of covering three things at once. It's similar. It's kind of akin to like what a pianist does in the sense of, of hitting you, comping bass notes totally. and then doing chords around it. But yeah, that, that, that hybrid instrument allows him to do that. And I mean, if you just heard it, you would swear it was two people. Oh, totally. It's insane. And as he's gotten better, because I used to follow, I mean, I've been following him since I was in high school. As he's gotten better, he's 
which is very interesting. I, I recommend this for all drummers. He's playing less. Right. I mean, he can play. I mean, I've seen him play like unreal technical stuff. Yeah. But the best stuff when we're playing is like whole note bass line. Yeah. Maybe some quarter notes, a couple eighth notes on the guitar part. Like it's super open. Yeah. And, you know, like I was telling you earlier about this song we did that's at 45 BPM. Yeah. It was grooving so hard at 45, which is not easy to do because there's no. these huge spaces that you can step in every second. You know what I mean? And so he's kind of, he's, it's interesting, he's just kind of pared back his, his sound. Right. But he's gotten so good that you literally close your eyes, you're like, yeah, that's a great bass player and an amazing guitar player. It's like, right. you would have no idea. It's unbelievable. And you see him do it, and it looks like he just he's like reading a paper. I'm like, man, it's crazy. you're a genius. Jesus. Well, to circle back, I guess I, I, I got sidetracked for a second, but I was just going to say that was a really amazing gig that I saw, and it was amazing, amazing seeing him playing with Mike Clark, of all people, who I think— Oh, Mike's a beast, man. Who, uh, along with Idris Muhammad, uh, to me, I think when I think of jazz funk, those are two of the guys that I certainly think of, and I think you have a lot of that in your playing. Thank along you. With, I'll take that. Uh, ultimately, I think a lot of kind of loose, kind of New Orleans, like greasy vibe, which I know from being down there and just growing up seeing it my whole life. Sure. So I think that's interesting that uh, that you have that, but I, maybe well, you got that via Idris. I'm fake. I'm you know <laughs> I'm trying to have that still. I mean, I listen to me play that stuff, and I'm like, eh. Because my brother, Jamie, played with the Dirty Dozen for like seven years. Yeah. And Terrence Higgins is, was the drummer in that Terrence band forever. Terrence is amazing. And so we became really good friends when I was like 18. I've known Terrence a long time. Terrence is badass. Oh, dude. He need, he needs to be on the cover of Modern Drummer. Fuck yeah, he does. I mean, that dude. He's one of my, he's, he's one, hands on one of my favorite New Orleans drummers. He can do There's all the New Orleans lot. stuff. He can do the rock stuff. Yeah. He can do, like, he plays with Ani DeFranco a ton. Like, yeah. he can cover all of those bases yeah. really, really for well. For real. Like, yeah. there's no joking around with that yeah. guy. And he's, like, a sweetheart, man. He's, like, one of the nicest and dudes. Can, and can shred when he oh, yeah. wants to. Like, when he wants to go to town, it's like, uh, <laughs> okay, you can do that too, I guess. Yeah. He's so incredible. So check out Terrence Higgins. Yes, yes. One of my favorite New Orleans drummers, hands down. But Adris, again, like, to me, talking about space and just not overplaying but just grooving your ass off at the yeah. same time like to me he was like one of the kings of that for sure you know the first record i ever heard him on was actually a schofield record called groove that's why i know him from i mean that stuff is so deep and so like i can play the notes but it's like it's just never the same you know it's just like everybody's fingerprint this is who they are right I, I came uh, became aware of Idris via Groovelation, John Schofield, and also I think Carrying On from Grant Green. Oh and yeah, they, yeah. They play a meter song on there, which is funny. I think they do Ease Back or something, and he plays it super slinking, kind of jazzier once again. But what's interesting is I'm uh, buds with uh, one of Idris's cousins, this guy Bruce Dunham that I know from the West Coast. Oh cool. He played with Leo Nosatelli, the guitarist of the Meters, for a while. And uh, I met him at this bizarre gig that we played out in the middle of fucking nowhere in the mountains in Colorado. Oh, wow. And in, like, a coal mining area where trains were coming oh by, like, Oh, my God. Wah! Like, in the middle Kinda of Kind of like here. Yeah, exactly. Uh, only dark and, like, like donkey-faced, like, hippies that are oxygen-deprived oh and sunked on all, all the imaginable oh, hallucinogens man. you could imagine. Well, I lived in Boulder for four years. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> so it was definitely those. There was a lot of hula hoops, a lot of weed smoking. And uh, I met him. A lot of kind craft vegan burritos. Yes, exactly. Kind beers and everything's kind, which is is great. Right, exactly. Literally, one of the the guitarists told me, he's like, someone is going to walk up to you and offer you weed and be like, here, take some, brother. And I was there for all of five (laughs) minutes, and one of the first dudes that walked up to me, he's dreadlocked, fucking oxygen-deprived fucking character, of course, verbatim said that i was like wow this is and it's not like a little bit it's like a ziploc bag filled yeah it's it's they're like oh here you go man Enjoy. mountains of weed yeah that's all they have out there yeah well and they have great skiing and climbing it's great beautiful. skiing mountain biking whitewater rafting all the shit that i like to do that growing up in the south in the fucking swamps i was definitely not doing not access to yeah. so i find that stuff fascinating but um what i was gonna say is uh bruce told me because uh we started talking about zig and the meters and everything and he said Man, Zig would come over and watch Idris play in the house, and oh, that's cool to hear. That yeah, makes sense. Yeah, yeah, right. And uh, he's the only person that that, and he grew up with with Idris, and um, he was the one that told me that. And I that's haven't really cool heard anyone link. ever say that. But yeah, I wouldn't have put that together. Yeah, well, because Zig's is more straight up, kind of hard, like funk, and it's absolutely amazing. He's in the Mount Rushmore of funk drummers oh, for man, sure. I love, yeah, but I, I, I can see. I mean. 
similar with Johnny Vidakovic, who I think you have some some similarities to. I love to Johnny's and, playing too. Yeah, uh, another amazing. There's about the South. Yeah, like Blade Brian Blades, like also want to like he's, he's insane. I mean, you just drop his name and people just start going, oh, <laughs> uh, oh my god, stop it! You yeah, know? like there's just some I don't know. The South is like there's something about it. So I have a theory about the the feel of drummers and just in general. A lot of people have said that New Orleans is kind of like the northernmost Caribbean city. So it's sort oh, of oh that's cool. It, yeah, it kind of has this. Caribbean pacing, uh, and it's it has Big such time. a deep history. And I've I've said if there was ever a city that had ghosts, <laughs> that 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 town is crawling with fucking ghosts. And um, Big time. I think it, it also has a lot to do with the heat and the drinking. And I think so. If 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 some of these ryth- rhythms were coming from Africa and then through the Caribbean, then back through, and all this this kind of con- confluence of rhythms and well, shit. Well, a lot of marching kind of you know like all the the parades and everything I have a very specific yes. sound when you think of a parade band right it's really specific yeah and that probably crept its way yes. onto the kit somehow it 100% did those rhythms ended up infiltrating I think the street it was street music yeah essentially but somewhere in between the drinking the lackadaisical sort of culture and the heat rhythm started sort of shifting and got things, a little loose I think that's that's you're probably not wrong. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've never, I actually haven't really thought about how that all happened, but that's a very good You theory. posed the question, that would be, that's about as close yeah, to Yeah, you my get a couple, what, what are those like icy drinks they get at night? Uh, it's like they're like a slushy, but they're just basically all booze down there. The the crazy ones in the quarter? And they're like, yeah, they're like this Oh, big. they're hand grenades, and then oh they're my uh, God. hurricanes. Hurricanes. Oh, yeah. There's I had w- one of those when I was down there with my brother. I was actually playing with Melvin Sparks at nice. Jazz Fest. And my brother took me out. He's like, man, we gotta go. Out. We're gonna go out. And I'm like, okay, cool. He hands me this like blue. I, fr- I think it was like blue. Yeah. And I was like, dude, I'm not drinking that. <laughs> He's like, you're gonna have a good time if you drink this. And I was like, okay. And I'm looking around and like everyone's drinking them and everyone's just having a blast. And I'm yeah. like, yeah, this is probably why shit went from straight eighth to like, oh, there's a little shuffle in there now. <laughs> totally. You know what I mean? It's like right. a little. It's just. Yeah. A little looser than straight. Right. You know. And yeah. to me, that's like the cool zone to. It is a bridge. A, it is a very cool one. And it makes people dance, man. It makes right. people feel good. It's, you know, because people are having a good time when they're, like, in that zone. Yeah. I don't know. Who knows? I I mean, I, I 100% agree. It's a it's a very strange thing. And growing up down there, I didn't really have a sense of it and, and appreciate it as much. Like, living down there, I was like, what's going on in New York? Like, yeah, who are yeah, all yeah, these yeah. killer fucking players? that's, like, your hometown. You're just yeah, going, yeah. like, oh, I'm in New Orleans. That's cool. But. And it's it was once I ended up up here where I would go see shit, and I, was, I, would just, I, I just reminded of that. It, it, there are aspects of music and culture and aesthetics and fucking everything about it, food, you name it, that only exists there. Oh, New totally. Orleans is such I mean, you a, grew up in a really, like, 1% unique, you know what I mean? Like, so, like, unique. Yeah. Yeah, I, there's no other place on the earth like New Orleans. No, no. You know, and I haven't even spent that much time there. But through my brother and I played jazz fest a, a couple times. Yeah, I've never been anywhere like that. For ever. sure, I've been places that want <laughs> to recreate like the French Quarter and all that, but it's right. like that's not happening. Yeah, you know, like Tipitinas and like even the House of Blues down there is dope. It's badass. You know what I mean? That's actually where I saw Charlie Hunter and Mike Clark in that that show. And in the it was main room or in the little room? The main room. Wow. Yeah, and it was it was incredible. Yeah. There's That's no shortage. Do you know Luther Dickinson or any of those guys from yeah. the North Mississippi also? Yeah, yeah, those guys are awesome. So we used to play down there with those guys a bunch, too. Those are, again, guys that grew up in the South. Yeah. They're like more Memphis kind of zone. but Right. Killer I mean, players. Super greaseball. Yeah. You know what I mean? In the best possible way. Yeah. Yeah, I saw the North Mississippi All Stars uh, on their first record at Tipitina's right oh, when they were wow. first coming out, and it was like, "Who are these guys?" Yeah, and uh, I was I was like, "Wow, this fucking drummer is killing these guys are these guys are great." Yeah, Cody and Luther, and that's what's funny. Like Cody and Luther are like a couple years older than my brother and I. So Cody is the drummer, Luther's a guitar player, yeah. and I play drums, and my brother plays guitar, and so we kind of hit it off with them. There's also another band that used to be called the Slip, and now it's called the Bar Brothers. Okay. And we grew up around that same time with those guys. Another drummer, guitar player, brother duo. Yeah. And that's a dope band to check out, the Bar Brothers. Okay, I'll check them out. Really beautiful songwriting, unbelievable musicianship. Andrew Barr is, like, one of my favorite drummers. Awesome. And that dude also needs to be on the cover of Modern Drummer. (laughs) Everyone's like, who's that? And I'm like, go check him out. He's a badass. Right on. You know? 
Fuck yeah, man. I've actually seen uh, Luther, I believe, play with the Black Crows as well. Yeah, he played with Chris. Yeah. And uh, for a couple of years, I think. I saw them in New York, the Black Crows in New York, and Luther was playing with them. Yeah, I mean, that's a perfect fit. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And he can sing his face off. Fuck yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, he's on... Actually, they recorded in New Orleans at a studio. He's on one of my brother's records. He's playing guitar. They're doing trading off and stuff. And, the, you know, Dirty Brass... Uh, Dirty Brass... Dirty, Dirty Dozen. Dozen Brass Band's playing horns on the whole thing. Oh, cool. I was down there for that, eating shrimp po' boys. And, like, <laughs> my brother's out. like, you need to hang out down here for a while. I'm like, all right. <laughs> but I, awesome. I couldn't... Do, it was so crazy that I was like... You know, I was only down there for maybe, like, a week, week yeah. and a half. And I was like, I got like New York seemed totally sane. Oh, one hundred percent. After like New York seems like Disneyland after you hang out in New Orleans. <laughs> like you get it's like, I don't know. New Orleans is just like a different zone. It totally is, dude. I, I don't. I, when I go back, I'm like, God, how did I? This is why my just view on the world is skewed. It's different. Yeah. I feel like I'm coming it's from another thing, planet. Though, you know, it's a good thing. I tell you what, though, as I get older, though, every time I go back within about 24, 48 hours tops, I get super acidic, and I'm just like popping tums because I'm <laughs> fucking washing it down with beers and like eating all this acidic. Everything's food. fried and, and just wasted. And Cafe du Monde <laughs> and just eating beignets all day. I could literally sit there all day <laughs> and have coffee and beignets all day. Yeah. That's like some of the coolest simplest food yeah done so well and they don't care they're like here you go get out of here next yeah. next i mean new orleans is great i gotta get back down there at some point yeah man absolutely well and also just the music that's come out of there is pretty heavy big time speaking of uh of charlie hunter man uh i've i dig the music that i've uh, i've seen uh just more or less online i have yet to catch y'all live it's something that i need to do yeah anytime y'all y'all play well, let now me know. it's rare that i got a puppy we're playing actually you should come out if you want. It's actually a really cool brewery that opened in our town. Really? In Ridgefield. It's like an hour from here. No We're shit. We're playing June 3rd, I think. June 3rd or 4th at the uh, Nod Hill Brewery in my town. Awesome. We did one there. The owner's a guitar player, like amazing bluegrass guitar player. And I just said, hey, man, would you ever want me and Charlie Hunter to come by? And he was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> no shit? Yes. And I was like, okay, cool. So Charlie comes out and records at my house once in a while. Okay. After we recorded all day, we just went down there, set up for like three seconds and played and it was sold out no shit and it was super fun i actually posted that first show online it's on my youtube channel oh cool so you can watch it i will and i will like, include a link in the description most of that is all pretty much improvised that's amazing it's fun man charlie's super fun like that the first yeah. gig i ever did with him was a sold out show it was either it was like the night before new year's eve at irving plaza we were opening for snarky puppy whoa that was my first gig with him and i was like okay that's dope man like i'm I'd love to do it. Uh, send me the songs. And he's like, no, it's cool, man. We'll just figure it out when we what? show What? Come on. That's what I said. I was like, no, 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 no. Send me some tunes. I'll learn them. He's yeah. like, he goes, that's no fun, man. Just show up. Oh, my God, man. So, and he goes, you can only have, like, a really small kit, like kick, snare, drum. Right. I'm like, okay. Another, like, twist in the puzzle. Yeah. So I'm like, all right, cool. So my setup was, there's a video of that show, too. Okay. On my YouTube. I watched an awesome one today on your YouTube. That was really cool. Is it a trombone was, player? No, it was a sax. It was a trio with oh, sax. Oh, it was probably Rob it was Dixon. wide shot. Yeah. yeah. It's awesome. Your kit, by the way, was something I wanted to talk to you about. Sure, yeah, yeah, The kit that you're playing, and some of the stuff that I've seen with you online, is uh, the one with the wooden hoops, wood finish. It's a really beautiful kit. Oh, that's that's a special one, yeah. Yeah. So that that's what I was just saying earlier. My 40th birthday is on May 11th. Yeah. And so I've been working with Ron Danette for the last bunch of years and just love what he's doing with George Way and Danette drums and all that stuff. And so I was like, man, I want to have, like, a really cool – kit made for my birthday Fuck like yeah. a special kit yeah that i just like that kit will be like in the grave with me you know yeah and so he's like all right man well let me know what you want to do so i got together with this guy in australia paul wary who finds this like unbelievable wood like the wood they have down there is completely different than what they have here right like walnut here is totally different than walnut down there well they have platypus platypi is, is plural for a platypus and they have like platypi i love that wom wombats and shit sure. so everything and is crazy anything there. that moves <laughs> will kill you down there <laughs> seriously they're like oh can you come down and do a clinic in australia i'm like no <laughs> because you gotta go man like the flies will bite you and you'll die <laughs> right i feel like everything that moves there will kill you and it's funny because paul <laughs> Would say, Paul Wary is like the guy who made the shells for that kit and the hoops. Uh huh. And he would send me photos of like 
spiders in his wood shop. Oh, man. And I'm not joking. They're like the size of a splash symbol. Jesus. And he's like, oh, yeah, man, I know you like bugs. He's like, this guy was hanging out under the wood. I was like, dude, stop. Sending. Spiders freak me the fuck out. Oh, totally. And there's some big, like, bugs down in the south. Or all oh, of them. and they fly. Flying cockroaches. And they fly. Yeah, like the whole Flying shit. Flying bugs are not cool. No, it sucks. Roaches. If you're, like, on the ground, I can run a little bit. But yeah. once you're airborne, Yeah, it'll I'm fly out. in your mouth. I'm out. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I'm going to go to the airport. I'm leaving, wherever we are. You know, yeah. like, I've, like, the Amazon and all that sounds dope. But yeah. then I think, realistically, like, I'm going to be camping on the floor in the woods. Yeah. And there could be... 8,000 things that could kill you in the middle of the night. Or just like crawl in your ear and nest in it, and then you're like, what's you don't in my know fucking for like a ear? Year. You don't know for a year. Yeah, it just incubates in your fucking ear, oh and then they got to, oh, Jesus. Yeah. I've seen video of that. No That's thanks. one of the things that I wish I would have never seen. That's like a clip that would show up on Instagram. Yeah. And have like 10 million views. Like, oh, did you see this larvae <laughs> that uh, hatched out of this poor guy's ear? That would be right. me. That would be my luck. Right. So, yeah, be careful. Wear ear condoms when you go yeah. sleep in the Amazon. Don't go to Australia <laughs> unless you have, like, a full hazmat suit on. Exactly. Basically. Exactly. Oh, so the bir- – sorry. <laughs> Tangent. So that birthday kit was a one-off kit, 12, 14, 20. Nice. It's Australian walnut, which looks nothing like walnut here. It's, like, more orange and red. And yeah. It's almost got, like, a sunset kind of color thing it's in the beautiful. wood. beautiful. I mean, it's – I'm super spoiled, man. I've got three kits at home. I have a – no, I have four kits at home. Okay. I have two walnut kits. I have a Duco kit that's made out of mahogany. I have that kit. And then a kit that's coming out in a couple of weeks, actually, at the Chicago Drum Show I'm doing on May 19th. Nice. Is uh, a signature kit that I designed with Ron that's 12, 14, 20 acacia wood, which kind of looks like koa uh-huh. from Hawaii. It's beautiful. Wow. Um, and those are coming out. Those are already pre-ordering at, like, drum shops. People are like, man, I pre-ordered This your- is your signature drum set? Yeah. That's amazing, And man. I was like, I haven't even played one yet. How are you pre order <laughs> People are like, I can't wait to get it. And I'm like, I don't even have one. <laughs> so I'm playing it for the first time at the Chicago Drum Show, which I can't wait to sit down and play it. That's amazing. And that's off after a year and a half ago we did a signature snare. Ron was like, people want a drum from you, man, so, like, design one. Yeah. I was like... I thought he was joking. Yeah. Ron and I joke around all the time. And he's like, no, I'm dead serious. Like, you should design whatever snare you think you would want built. That sold out in, like, two days. Gone. Are you serious? So then we did another one out of the Acacia wood that's not limited edition. It's, like, going to keep – it's hard to find because they keep selling out. Right. First day at NAMM, we launched it in January. Sold out – the first batch sold out in that – in that day really 24 hours sold out holy shit so that's an ongoing thing and the kit's going to be an ongoing thing wow so all you drummers yeah check out that kit congratulations that's that's amazing yeah i feel super lucky thank you wow very cool holy moly dude well we we talked uh, about charlie hunter but i didn't even ask you how you got the gig in the first place with charlie yeah so this comes back to new orleans oh really so (laughs) i was living in colorado my brother is two years older. He had just graduated from Boston College. I said, man, why don't you just come out here and we'll play? Moves to Boulder. We're like the house band for all, like, Schofield, Maceo Parker, everybody that comes through, we would open up for. Wow. Charlie came through. We opened up for him a bunch. I think we played, like, four nights in a row with him at different places, like Denver, Boulder. all. And I just kind of talked with him. was like, man, I'm a huge fan. And so we kind of, like, I met him when I was... 17 or 18 I was probably 18 I was probably 18 wow and we kind of just stayed in touch like we'd see each other at different shows and I'd go up and say hi and I was just a huge fan of his playing and then um, you know I moved up here and we stayed in touch a little bit he actually recommended me for the Melvin Sparks gig which is my first gig in New York oh cool and then like you know one day he just kind of called like dude we've never played together (laughs) and I was like yeah I guess that's true He's like, why don't you, because he, he lives in New Jersey. He lives not far from me. He's like, yeah. just come by the house. Let's play. I was like, okay, cool. And I was all excited. I was like, dope. Of course. So I show up, and he just starts playing. And his groove is so ridiculous that you can't not but just jump in. Yeah. And so we played that day for like three hours straight, never said a word to each other. We just played. It was like an instant old shoe or something that yeah. you put on. It's like, oh, this feels totally correct. And then he said, hey, he just texted me, hey, man, can you do this gig at uh, Irving. Irving Plaza? Yeah. It's like uh, on the 30th. And I was like, yeah, what's, he's like, it's opening for Snarky Puppy. It's sold out. Can you do it? And I was like, totally. I just, you know, and then again, I said, send me the charts. He's like, ah, no, just show up and we'll just play. <laughs> right, exactly. I'm like, dude. And that's what happened. I showed up and he's like, just follow me. It's easy. Yeah. So that's how he is, man. He's, 
He's just very like he trusts. He knows whoever he's gonna call. He can kind of like trust. Right. You know what I mean? And he has such amazing ears. Uh, that clearly. He's, you know, he's calling people that he knows can play for wow. whatever you know whatever that thing is. And he, dude, check this out. So he played with Idris. Yeah. I mean, he's played with everybody. So like, I can ask. I'd be like, man, what was it like touring with Idris for two weeks? He's like, amazing. He's like, and he would show me stuff that he would play. Because Charlie yeah. can do that. Right. Yeah, I feel like, I swear to God, he has, like, a photographic memory. He'd be like, oh, Idris would play this kind of groove. And he'd sit down and play it. I'm like, that does sound like something that he would play. Oh, my God. So it was kind of a trip. He's, like, a little bit of an encyclopedia. Tell it clearly. But that's that's how I started playing with him. And we played a bunch together. We did two records, which neither of them have. One of them's coming out soon with this girl, Silvana Estrada, from Mexico, who's amazing. Uh huh. That's, like, a really dope. Not songwriter, right? It's kind of songwriter, like, all in, uh, basically in Spanish. And um, it's me and Charlie and her. She's playing Cuatro. It's a beautiful record. And then the last th- last thing we did at my house is just an instrumental record that's going to come out who knows when. Okay. But maybe I'll give you some clips you can play. Yeah, fuck yeah, man. That's yeah. A, I'm, I'm all about hearing it. Uh, everything that I've seen online, uh, once again, I, I dig the, the sort of loose... Uh, and once again, it's kind of that open, it's kind of jazzy sound that both Mike Clark and Idris used, uh, where it's just big, kind of open, smaller drums necessarily, but like open tuning and kind of the jazzy big aspect. Big sound, yeah. Bigger cymbals. Like, I just love the sound and your feel with it combina- combined with all that. It's great. Thank, well, thank. I appreciate that. I'm just trying to do my best, Yeah. you know, imitation of those guys. And that's how I think everybody, like if you asked Idris, he'd be like, oh, I'm just doing my best. Max yeah. Roach or what you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To me, when you ask like your idols, like, well man, like how did you get there? They're like, oh, man, I'm just trying to do Tony Williams. Yeah. Or whatever. And that's I think that's ultimately how you find your own thing. Sure. Is you try copying a bunch of people and then you realize, well man, I can't sound like, you know, like Jack DeJeanette or I can't right. sound like, you know, Paul Motion. Yeah. But you try to and then you kind of find your own thing mm-hmm. along that kind of path. Sure. I mean, what's crazy, the craziest thing to me right now is people are like, man, I really like your sound. And I'm like, what is that? (laughs) I think I I just described a little bit of it. Yeah, but it's like, to me, in my head, I still feel like I'm 17 in my basement, like, (laughs) trying to figure it out. You know what I mean? So Uh it's cool. I mean, to me, that's like one of the biggest compliments is like, if you can have your own sound on the drums, that's like a really special thing, I think. 110%, man. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... Ideally, yeah. If you can have any kind of identity that you convey via an instrument, yes, I think that that's not, the goal, right? Yeah, it's not an easy path, man. It, it's it like, absolutely isn't. And I honestly, to me, I don't. I mean, I'll take it all day, and I, I appreciate it. But I mean, I, I don't think I'll. I don't. You know, I think that's just with anybody. I don't think I'll ever be satisfied. Like, oh, uh-huh. well, there was this, or there's that sounded whack, or why did I do that? Yeah, or, yeah. That wasn't clean, or why did I play that idea? There's all these things that you doubt. Right. That's in anything. That's in any job any person doubts themselves sure you know? but that's how you get better it's either you crumble yeah under the doubt or you push yourself and get off your ass and go like i'm gonna play until it shit sounds correct yeah. in my head yeah you know um, i hear you i think you're right and that's what i'm doing now i mean i'm getting ready for the chicago drum clinic thing and they're like yeah you're the main slot on saturday i'm like great no pressure <laughs> And so I'm just trying to figure out what I'm going to do, you know, and I've kind of distilled it down to like, I'm going to do an hour clinic on getting your own sound. Yeah. Like not like, okay, that's a signature thing, but like getting different sounds out of the drums. Like you could do this, you could do this, you could tune them this way, you could use this thing, you could use this brush. I mean, there's, I mean, I could do five hour clinic on that, you know, it's kind of a never ending thing. For sure. But it's also a nuanced discussion that's important once again with about any instrument in particular, the drums, uh, because I think especially with sort of the oh here we go yeah yeah the the yeah, sh- bus the shredder uh aspect of a lot of stuff that's online i think a lot of people are so focused on just shredding you know that they yeah, don't even you know, necessarily think about even sort of just tonality and some of these or like their time <laughs> right which is a big deal and they get on a real gig and it's like oh yeah, I've been practicing the wrong shit. Yeah, anybody can play at like one thirty. Yeah, and just blazing. Like, <laughs> yeah. there's not a lot of room to make mistakes. But like again, put the metronome on at forty. Yeah, and try to groove your ass off. Good luck. Yeah, it's tough. I'll see you two bars later when you turn the metronome off. <laughs> you know, oh that shit's hard and that's boring. It's like you know what though, that's the gig. Right. You know, and that to me is the the fun stuff to practice is the stuff that I know is the stuff that will like ground your plane as opposed to all the 
icing and fireworks right. that nobody will hire you for. Because, like, there's a seven-year-old kid probably in Japan on YouTube that can do all that stuff better yeah. than anyone. Yeah. But at the end of the day, that's not why contractors call you. That's not no. why band leaders call you. No. They're like, you have a good sound. You're consistent. You can read. Like, stuff that people can just count on. Yeah. It's not glamorous, but it's you'll work. It also bears mentioning that I think that if you spend your, your life shredding in a basement and not develop any kind of interpersonal skill. Or that, music. Or music or musicality in your playing. Yeah. Probably going to be rough unless you're just going to do, like, uh, clinics on how to do specific soloing. Yeah, and good luck. Good but luck with good that. Good luck with that, yeah. right? Like, that's a very, very small pool. And you honestly, I don't think, can make a real living doing no. that. Like, barely you could, but, like. You know, I mean, it's it's hard enough, and I have like a really lucky gig on Broadway, and it's like you know, friends of mine that work just business jobs are making yeah. ten times what I make. Right. And I'm like, oh damn, and I thought I was doing okay. Yeah. You know, it's just a it's whatever universe you're spinning in, <laughs> you think you're hot shit, and then you go to some other universe, you're like, oh, I'm like, I'm doing nothing. Right. You know, it's just per again, it's perspective, which I talk a lot about in lessons. It's like. It's all how you look at things. For sure. You know. Well, two questions for you. Uh, social media-wise, ultimately, I think the way that I found out about you was via social media, in particular, possibly Instagram or something like that. And then I realized you were playing with Charlie Hunter. I, I wish I could tell you exactly the chain of I know. Events. It's, it's I, I don't, But it is it is fascinating. So what uh, what do you feel is sort of your obligation with, with social media, and how do you feel it's helped you? Well, like... The Instagram thing in particular is funny because, like, I used to do photography full time. Like, I actually quit playing drums for a year. Really? Yeah, I just got fed up with the music industry and was like, you know what? I don't want to have to wait my whole life for someone to call me for a gig. Like, I'm a pretty motivated person. I'm going to go do something that is creative, that I dig, that I can do by myself. And I always loved photography, so I went out and started a photography company. Next thing I know, I'm like shooting weddings, I'm shooting business things, I shot stuff for like Allstate Insurance, and that like one gig paid more than what I made on drums for like a month and a half, like for a two hour shoot. I was like, man, I should just do this. Yeah. So I literally focus on photography. And so like my, and I started Instagram around the same time. So I was, I was like, oh cool, like a photography app basically is how I looked at it. So I was posting like landscape photography, like I'm yeah. a big bourbon whiskey guy, I have a yeah. big collection. So I was like posting like, really beautiful shots of like you know whatever William LaRue Weller and like all these different bourbons that I was proud of finding and then like I'd post like a drum video and all these people would be like whoa dude that sounds sick or all these comments and I'm like oh people like the drum stuff so then I started posting more drum stuff and it was like then I'd get a hundred followers that day what and then I'd post more and then I find people were like stop with the bourbon stop just post drum stuff like people were like messaging me really they're like quit it and so I just started posting. I was like, all right, I'm going to delete everything else. <laughs> Holy and shit. I'm just going to do drum stuff. And so that's kind of how it started. And then one day I woke up and I was like, oh, shit, I have 10,000 people following me. What? And then it went really quickly for like a few months. I, I got to like 20,000. I was like, all right, this is enough. This is crazy. <laughs> and now I'm at almost like 40,000. It's just bizarre. And I don't know if they're like real people or if they're robots or uh, who cares. But it's fun to like... I try to put one thing out a day. Yeah. Whether it's a cool photo of something I'm digging or like a little video of something I'm working on. And I don't think too much about it. I'll like wake up, have coffee, do it with the puppy, yeah. say goodbye to my wife. And I'm like, play drums in your pajamas. Yeah. Like I'll, <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that quite a yeah, few times. Yeah. People love the pajama. And those, <laughs> those RIP, those uh, Ralph Lauren pajama bottoms are now dead because my dog ripped them in half. Oh, okay. All like right. I was walking him in the morning, gone. Just oh. 10, like 10 inch gap in the whole, I was like, all right, those are retired. Yep. Um, but I just try to keep it like kind of loose, you know, because I don't know, people take it really seriously. And at the end of the day, it's like, dude, I'm trying to have some fun playing drums, guys. like yeah. lighten up. Yeah. Like I'll put a mask on sometimes be like, why are you wearing a mask? I'm like, I don't know. Cause I saw it and I put it on. That was funny because fun guys. Yeah. Remember and when we used to do that? I'm half asleep in the morning <laughs> and like, why not? Right. Sometimes you can put the mask on, you know, I don't know. I just, to me it's, and sometimes I'll try to like really show like all right this is how i work on this and like mm. break down like a little idea but to me it's kind of a fun little thing like all right what should i talk about today or whatever you know and i like the uh the the one groove three different bpms oh yeah that's a really cool idea and it's funny more often than not uh the medium one seems to sound like the right one so to yeah, speak. yeah yeah you know well usually 
It's funny doing those, and I did those because everyone's so obsessed with playing the fastest. Yeah. Oh, I can do it this fast. I can right. do this. And I'm like, there's other tempos you could play that <laughs> same groove at, and it's actually more challenging to do the slowest one. For sure it is. That's the hardest. For the sure. hardest is always the slowest. Yes. But if you take some drum and bass groove that Zach Danzinger played or Mark yeah. Giuliano played, and slowed it down to 45. Oh, God. Good luck playing that. <laughs> yeah. It's fucking impossible. <laughs> yeah. Because that sound is at, like, a specific zone. Sure. And ballads are like, boom. Yeah. But you're not cramming in, like, boom. <laughs> boom. Yeah. So you're not doing that. No. It just doesn't make sense. No. So that's, that's originally why I did the first one. And it started getting so many views. People were like, man, that was dope. And I was like, man, I could do this all day. You just take a groove and play it at three tempos. It's not that difficult Yeah. to think of. It's difficult to play slow. The medium and fast ones are always the easiest for me. Sure. Um, but the slow, like, you really have to analyze the notes you're playing. Right. And the little ghost notes and the dynamics. All that stuff gets exposed. Like, slow tempos to me are, like, under a magnifying glass. For sure. Whereas, like, super fast stuff is just, like, a car going by. And you're like, I think that was cool. Right. But who knows? Because it went by so fast, like you don't really know. Yeah, you know. Um, Jojo Mayer, uh, one of the things that he said, because uh, he said people ask them about executing notes at fast tempos, and one of the things that he said he said that he asks then asks them is, well, how how fast or in your case slow can you hear it? Totally, well, that's and it, that's man. the if big thing, right? It. If you can't hear it or have a sense of the placement of it. You're going to be fucked. No, yeah. If you can't hear it or sing it in your head, yeah. don't even go to the drums. No. Because it's just going to fail. Trash cans falling down a staircase is what that's going to totally. sound Totally. Like. <laughs> or, or just, you know, and this is something when I teach, because I've been teaching a ton in the last couple of years, is all play a groove. And I'm like, all right, we're going to do Simon Says. And you have to play the, and they're in the room with me. Uh -huh. There's no excuse. Like, oh, I didn't hear that. And I'm like, play me this exact groove. And I'll start really simple and they'll get it. And then I'll add like a couple little things dynamically gone out the window right i'm like you didn't play that ghost note and then this note you did play you right. played twice as loud as i played yeah so it's not exactly the same and they're like oh i didn't know you meant exactly verbatim yeah. and i'm like no no no. <laughs> that's why i said exactly <laughs> and that's a lesson i learned at lion king when i first showed up to audition i played the notes exactly as they were on paper but like an accent wasn't quite loud enough like by a half of a dynamic mark wow and they said you're not ready go home what? Yeah, and I was like, oh, shit. Jesus. Okay. So that really opened up my ears to, like, what exact means. Whoa. On that level, when they say play exactly this, yeah. they're not fucking around. And if you think they are, you won't get the gig. Right. And then you're going to go like, man, I'm not making it. And it's like because you're not looking at the small details. Right. And those details are what kill people's careers. Sure. So would yeah. you say that some of your dynamic sense came from that instance? Yeah, well, I thought about it a lot more seriously. Yeah. I was like, oh, there's a whole world of... I, mean, I, I thought I had decent dynamics before, but like, I had never done a Broadway thing, so I didn't realize it was that. And I said, okay, cool. I got it. I got your number now. Give me a week, and I will go over this with a fine-tooth comb, and it'll be perfect when I come back. Oh, God. <coughs> that gives me anxiety. Oh, dude, it was... <laughs> I feel like I was going to have a heart attack on the first gig. <laughs> and actually, one of the... <laughs> I think the keyboard player on my first gig was like, hey, man, I know it's your first show, and it's kind of like the hot seat that you're in tonight. So, like, if you need heart rate medication, I, I have some. Oh, my God, And I dude. was like, ha, ha, ha. He's like, I'm totally serious. Yeah. And I was like, oh, shit. Wow. Okay. Oh, shit. Is right. I didn't take any, but, like, you know, it's super nerve-wracking because the lights go down in the theater. There's 1,700 people God. paying a ton of money to see the show, and you're like, I hope I memorize these 10,000 things. Wow. Here we go. Yeah. And if you really bomb, you're out. Sure. And that word gets out around town on right. the Broadway thing. And oh, like They're not sure. going to call you again. It's a niche community. It's Yeah, yeah it's sure. a pretty small thing, man. Like, I know a lot of, I mean, I didn't know a lot of people before, but now I know a lot of people, whether yeah. it's, you know, MDs or guitar players, bass players. Like, a lot of my good friends are all in the, that scene. Wow. Because that's kind of the new recording studio scene uh -huh. is Broadway. Like, the recording scene, everyone just has a studio at their house now. Yeah. Like, Charlie and I go to my house. We hang set everything up and it sounds amazing right it's like why would i go to some amazing studio and drop like 10 grand a day when i could do it for free at my house yeah you know so broadway is kind of that new place where everybody goes on like a daily basis it used to be like jingles and, uh -huh. and that kind of stuff and now it's just like well i'm on this show you know and, Damn. and it's it's you know i mean people do still do a lot of studio work and stuff but it's not it's maybe like 1 20th Right. Of what it was like in the 80s. Of course. Jesus. You know? Yeah. 
Well, man, one last thing, I guess. Uh, Fourhandsdrumming.com, your website. It's yeah. subscription-based. I've, I've had J.P. Bouvet and Stant Moore on the podcast, both of which have their websites. Oh, yeah. Those so guys you, are great, man. You are, J.P. Uh, lives in Brooklyn, I think, right? Uh, he's in Queens. On oh, Queens. Yeah. He's a, yeah. I went out went out to his place and talked to him. He's that dude's a, a monster. He's a monster and, and wise beyond his years. Uh, I couldn't believe in talking to him how just intelligent and composed and, and experienced such a young man could be yeah he seems like a wise dude it's insanity i died he's traveled a lot yes he has he goes over to i think china fuck yeah like all the time yeah. that'll teach you a lot right there on one trip exactly um, yeah forehands is a thing that i started i don't know a couple of years ago just because people kept asking me like hey show me how you tune your drums hey what's that symbol hey how do you do this how do you do your single stroke rolls how do you and i was like and I try to answer everybody. I try to not be that guy that, like, I get a ton of questions, and I'm like, ah, I don't have time. It's like, right. I do have time. Like, yeah. I'm going to try to respond if I can to everybody. And finally, I was just, like, getting the same questions over, and I was like, why don't I just do lessons on these things yeah. and put them all on a site? And I tried to price it out for a year that's, like, totally – it's, like, I think it breaks down to, like, twelve fifty a month or something. It's not yeah. a lot of money. It's, like, a couple cups of coffee in New York. And it really breaks down my perspective on – a lot of my playing um, yeah. music tuning microphones recording like i you know bro getting ready for broadway i interviewed charlie nice i interviewed tom barney who plays bass at lion king but he I mean, he's played with sinatra miles davis steely dan i mean he's like wow. michael jackson elton john i mean he's played with everybody holy shit so having a drummer watch a bass player talk about what they want is to me invaluable and not every day you get to see tom barney talk candidly about what he wants in a drummer that's amazing. You know, so I just tried to do stuff that if I stepped back and said, what do, what would I want to check out? And that's what I would do. Yeah. A lot of it's groove based. You know, there's phrasing ideas, but that's just forehandsdrumming.com. All right. Um, and there's like a little trailer. You can check it out and you get it for a year and then it's out. And, you know, in a year you can learn a, a ton. You can watch it on your phone. I guess it's that's awesome. like the way of the future. I guess it is. We are we are there, and it's only getting stranger. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> At some point, you'll just download the lesson into your, you know, into your phone, and then all of a sudden, it'll just be in your brain. Right. Somehow. Yeah. Bluetooth connect to, straight to the brain from the phone. That's probably not far away. Jesus, that's frightening. In a decade, it'll probably be a real yeah, thing. Exactly. And we'll be like, real. man, we didn't know anything back then. <laughs> Exactly. Well, Carter, man, it was fun talking to you, man. Yeah, of course. Pleasure, dude. Absolutely. Thank you for having me on. 100%. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks to Carter for taking the time to catch up with me. It was really cool talking to him and uh, picking his brain about the many things that we were able to talk about. And definitely in a different environment than I'm accustomed to doing it. By no means a controlled environment. But, uh, yeah, what a great drummer and... Uh, one that I definitely find inspirational when it comes to dynamics, groove, tuning, listening, basically everything that makes a great drummer. Check back in next Monday for an awesome talk with drum killer Ken Shock, who played in Candiria and Fuel, and is an amazing teacher, guru, and general badass. Y'all won't want to miss that one. So we'll catch you on the next one. Crash, bang, boom!